Okay, good evening. Welcome to the 21st ACOP Forum on Architecting Security to Future Proof Smart Cities Against Emerging uh, Cyber Physical Threats. My name is Inzer. I'll be doing the introduction before I hand over to the speaker. For those who are new to ISS, our ISS vision is to enable a digital economy that is always learning and always leading. Our mission is to develop digital talent through education, applied research, consulting, and career services. So that's our ISS vision and mission. In ISS, our education is what we call practice-based education, which means that we not only provide the theory to you, but we also have an industry practical uh, focus. So this slide is just a snapshot of our graduate programs and also our executive education in ISS. So ranging from, for example, cybersecurity to digital strategy and leadership. Right, just some of, a snapshot of our executive education in ISS. ISS is also a partner with uh, IC Squared, and we are the only authorized official training partner in Singapore. And for ISC, IC Squared courses, all certified instructors in Singapore deliver their IC certification courses in, in, in ISS. Now back to the architecture community of practice. We have actually been running this architecture community of practice for coming to seven years, right? So um, this ACOP community is actually made of passionate professionals specializing in the various architectures like enterprise architecture, business information application, security, and also solution architectures. And ACOP was formed with the objective of promoting the advancement of the architecture practice in Singapore through collaborative learning, sharing, and also um, networking with the fellow community of practitioners. So that is our, the, our reason for forming the ECOP community of practice. And we also welcome contributions from community, community of practitioners. So let's say if any one of you um, has your architecture experience to share, right? You can also get in touch with uh, me or any of our members in ACOP. For this session, uh, please note to um, mute your microphone, right? Uh, if you want to ask questions uh, during the session, you can use the Zoom chat function, right, to ask your to ask your questions. And at the end of this session, please also help us to complete the e feedback. Right, so that we can actually improve the session. And at the end of the, after receiving your feedback, we also send you a copy of the speaker's presentation slides and also a link to the recorded session. So for this session, um, if you want to ask any questions, you can just uh, unmute, right, during the session and you can also ask your questions. At the end of the session, we also have like uh, 15 minutes for Q&A. So this is the feedback uh, survey link. So for tonight's session, um, our speaker is Mr. Steven Sim. He's actually the Vice President of ISACA Singapore. And Steven will be speaking on architecting security to future-proof smart cities against emerging cyber physical threats. So without further ado, I will hand over the session to Steven. Um, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, um, I need to share my screen, right? Yep. I think if you are still sharing, I can't share it. Okay, let me end my share. Yeah. Okay. Let's see.
Can you all see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay, um, I hope you all have a good dinner. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, ISS and uh, Ing Zhi for organizing this uh, session. Um, my topic is going to cover three key areas, uh, primarily across understanding the ter terrain itself, our enemies, I mean, taking a leaf off the defense doctrine, and um, future proving within the next one hour or so. An hour will definitely not do justice to this uh, heavy and uh, complex topic. And I understand that all of you come from uh, diverse backgrounds and disciplines. I hope that um, you will find my presentation relevant and useful. If nothing else, um, I really hope that you can minimally walk away with understanding the thought process that goes behind the solutioning of such an architecture. Uh, actually, basing largely from my personal experience at work. I mean, if you are looking at more in-depth uh, study of this subject, uh, you definitely require more than an hour. And as part of this uh, ACOM or Architecture Community of Practice, I also hope to learn from your experiences as well. So there are three key uh, phrases in this title itself. Uh, first and foremost, architecting cybersecurity. Next is the uh, future-proof smart cities. And thirdly, emerging cyber physical threats. I will elaborate on them as I go through my slides. At the end of the presentation, uh, I'll try to answer uh, the questions that you posted. Uh, but before I begin, I just want to mention the disclaimer you notice at the bottom of, at the footnote of this set of slides, that the views and opinions expressed in this presentation are those of mine and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of any organization. Okay, um, what is the backdrop to the need to architecture um, cybersecurity to future-proof smart cities? As some of you may already be aware, uh, increasingly um, large cities have been the news of late of being breached. According to the recent MESOFT's research, in 2019 alone, the United States um, was hit by a large number of ransomware attacks that impact um, at least 948 government agencies, as educational establishments, and healthcare providers. At a cost uh, upwards of uh, 7.5 billion. And this incidence, they disrupted the lives of people, especially in terms of their health and safety. Um, for instance, uh, emergency patients had to be redirected to other hospitals. Medical records were inaccessible or permanently lost. To make things worse, surgical procedures were cancelled, tests were postponed, and admissions halted. And even the 911 services in the States were disrupted as well. So the cyber threats of these days, especially the more recent NotPetya, uh, just back two years ago, as well as last year's uh, real ransomware, uh, really shows us that cyber resilience is very key to ensuring business continuity. So this session, I hope to share architecture and governance strategies um, that can be applied holistically against such threats. And with industrialization 4.0, you hear of these buzzwords every time. Uh, in smart cities, the lines between 
cyber and physical space continues to blur. And against the, this backdrop of uh, advanced and sophisticated threats, uh, the posture maturity, security posture maturity needs to be uh, further realigned and becomes very important and imperative. Okay, with that, let's look at the three key areas I mentioned earlier. What is our terrain, understanding our enemies and architecting for future proving? This is just a quick um, overview of the agenda I'll be running through. Um, we, def we need to first understand our terrain. Uh, what do we mean as a, uh, when we say smart city? And what makes it smart and why are we so concerned with the cybersecurity of smart cities? Next up, we need to understand our enemies, who they are, what they can do, and what constrains us in protecting or defending ourselves against them. Not least and most importantly, how do we architecture, how do we architect for the future? How can we future proof? By understanding key guiding principles, controls, and eventually translating all this into the correct um, architecture itself. So first up, what is our terrain? Okay, I, I got this um, from Sabana Jurong. In system architecture, as many of you might already be aware, we, we of, often talk about front end and back end. And from a consumer front end angle, uh, when we think about smart homes or smart cities, we think about smart homes, uh, smart toilets, elderly monitoring, uh, smart lighting, predictive maintenance, smart CCTV, and so, so on and so forth. So what comes immediately to mind is that there is a need for a lot of um, sensor, sensors for sense making and a huge number of them. And um, <clears throat> as published by the Smart Nation Singapore, the Smart Nation, um, this is, these are the key milestones for strategic national projects all the way onwards from 2018 and to 2020 and beyond. And I just want you to focus on the Smart Nation Sensor Platform or SNSP for short. Uh, this comes in the likes of uh, smart lampposts. So when a car travels past the smart lampposts, you detect that you just passed that area. Uh, smart meters for power, as well as smart urban mobility in the lights of automated guided vehicles or autonomous vehicles or AVs for short, uh, which is being uh, experimented right now in uh, the west of Singapore. So these are all um, visible front end stuff, right? Very visible to us. But what about the supporting back end infrastructure? For many of you, in the, if you are in the cybersecurity field, um, the Singapore cybersecurity strategy that was that comes in the booklet, whether it's in hard copy or soft copy, uh, back in 2016, should not be unfamiliar to you. And um, here's a recap of the Singapore cybersecurity strategy. It lists out the the 11 critical information infrastructure sectors, or CII for short. And so what this means is that all those front end sensors you saw earlier, right? Uh, they have to be connected to these uh, critical back end systems to become smart. Yeah. And what does it really mean to be smart? Is it simply um, connecting front end sensors to back end systems? Essentially, Industrialization 4.0 talks heavy about the use of cyber physical systems or CPS for short. 
what are cyber physical systems? <coughs> NIST has a long definition of it, right? Uh, I'll spare you the jargon on the left side. Um, essentially, what it means is that it is a physical machinery controlled by IT over the network. To put it simpli more simplistically, this includes uh, operational technology, or OT for short, and IIoT, Industrial Internet of Things. So, um, OT itself covers the industrial control systems, ICS for short, and uh, supervisory control and uh, data acquisition systems, or SCADA, as well as distributed control systems, otherwise known as DCS. And usually when we talk about OT, we cannot run away from discussing about um, human machine interface or HMI and programmable logic controller or PLC. Okay. So I want you to focus on this concept map for cyber physical systems. For cybersecurity, there is a emphasis on there's an emphasis on resilience privacy, malicious attacks, and intrusion detection. But these are not all, okay? So, <clears throat> what is OT, IOT, and IIOT? If it is not confusing enough, um, as I mentioned earlier, there is this notion of IIOT. We know what OT is, right? Essentially, these are as I mentioned earlier, um, they are critical equipment and they have an impact to safety. And when we talk about IoT, we think about IP cameras, our smartphones, our printers connected to the network, which are not so critical, but still co uh, but connected to the internet. So what happens when we go smart is that increasingly we move OT which was built originally with the intent to be in closed networks. Because they're so critical and there wasn't a need then to connect to the internet. But now, they are connected to the internet. Hence, um, becoming essentially critical. So you move from OT on the left to IoT and Conversely, from the other perspective, having IoT, Internet of Things, which is not typically so critical, becoming now becoming used in more critical functions, and therefore had to be made to a certain extent to be uh, tweaked to a certain extent to be industrial grade. And for those of you with cybersecurity background, you are definitely not unfamiliar with the CIA TRAD or CIA tenets of uh, where C stands for confidentiality, I for integrity, and uh, A for availability. Because when we look at threats, when we look, perform threat modeling, we see how it impacts C, I, and A. But with OT and IIoT, the fourth element of safety comes into the picture in particular with smart systems. What this means is that in order of importance, um, the highest or topmost is safety, followed by, integ um, followed by integrity. When we talk about safety, we talk about safety of human lives. Integrity, uh, data integrity, system integrity. And thirdly, availability of the system. Sorry, uh, firstly, you talk about safety. Uh, secondly, the availability of systems. Um, thirdly, the integrity of the systems. And lastly, on the confidentiality of the data or the system itself. So this is what makes um, OT and IoT different from IT systems. 
IT systems of, often um, put C at the top or sometimes C and A together. But safety is typically not a major concern over there. Some of you may hear a lot of buzz about cyber physical convergence. And indeed, um, with the convergence of the cyber physical systems, with the use of cyber physical systems, the, um, with the convergence of the realms of cyber and physical, this also means that the attack surface has increased. And systems of this nature are susceptible to both cyber and physical threats. For instance, think about uh, USB devices being plugged into smart equipment. <clears throat> In this survey from uh, Business Wire, many OT systems are now connected to IT systems and the internet. Exposing critical ICS assets to advanced persistent threats, or otherwise known as APTs. And advanced persistent threats tend to be uh, stealthy and difficult to detect and lurks around for a long time in the system before you can uh, detect them. Human machine interfaces, or HMIs for short, run commercial operating systems and often they are the highest risk components in industrial control systems. They often run off Windows and unfortunately more often than not, not the latest version of Windows system. And IIoTs um, connect critical machines and sensors in um, industries. In many of these industries, I mentioned about uh, 11 critical sectors. So high stakes industries include aerospace, defense, uh, healthcare, energy, and maritime. These are the systems in which failure often results in the life threatening situations or other forms of emergency situations. Right. Um, so this is telling us that there has been an increase in cyber incidents. I know the statistics have a bit dated, but uh, they have increased even further since then. And traditionally, the highlighted point over here is that traditionally, OT systems are air-gapped, but now many of these OT networks are connected to IT systems and the internet because of the need to transform digitally, the need to be smart, uh, embrace analytics, embrace um, sensors, and therefore exposing these assets to the advanced persistent threats I shared earlier. Okay, um, next, this is another survey from Tripwire, which is, uh, they did a survey, and uh, this survey tells us that more than 90% of uh, respondents expect a significant increase in risk caused by the use of IIoT, right? In fact, large companies are slightly higher percentage of them uh, expect a significant increase. <clears throat> and um, in 2018 itself, um, IIoT or IoT devi uh, devices are uh, exploited for uh, crypto mining malware, it grew by a whooping 400 percent in 2018, as reported by McAfee. And um, in 2019 itself, uh, cyber attacks on IoT devices surged 300 percent, and the loss was. Uh, and the number of uh, sorry, the number of devices were measured in the billions.
And then you have this recent high profile breaches in the news. I picked up two that was pretty recent. Critical information infrastructure without being that smart right now is already being breached as, as it is today. So the first one you see is uh, ransomware shuts down pipeline operator in the US. According to the alert, the victim failed to implement robust segmentation between IT and OT, or operation, uh, IT and OT networks, which allowed the, the attacker to traverse from IT to OT and disable assets on both networks. The attackers used ransomware to encrypt the HMIs or the human machine interfaces I mentioned about. And without, without these HMIs, the operators of critical machinery, they lose sight of their view. They do not know what is the status of the machinery and they are unable to gauge whether there are anything they need to tweak on the machine itself. And it, it, was, it was mentioned that the attackers were able to gain initial access to the facilities IT, starting from a spear phishing attack where the, the malware was downloaded. And the second one on India's largest uh, nuclear power station was happened in late last year. Um, the air gap that was shared earlier for OT equipment was found not to be actually in place at this uh, Kudankulam power station. There was evidence that humans as the weakest link, in cyber we always say humans are the weakest link, right? They were the ones to circumvent the air gaps and charging their personal mobile phones via the nuclear reactor control room USB slots. And therefore, uh, and they also installed um, remote access tools for contractors for ease of uh, troubleshooting. And as we grow smarter, uh, as we em embark on the journey to smart cities, um, the nature of all these setups will likely grow more complex. As uh, connectivity such as 5G becomes uh, critical in being smart because you need the real-time response to react fast to the sensor information and perform the calculations. And, and, and therefore, the air gaps continue to be further breached. Okay, this this itself comes from McKenzie. Um, in in this day and age where everything cutting edge uh, must have the word smart or the numeral 4.0. We can smart everything everything 4.0. We inevitably have to mention the supply chain itself and how it operates in a smart city. Again, in supply chain 4.0. A large portion of it is supported by cyber physical systems. You are looking at a red, rectangular red box. And let me zoom in for you in the next slide so that you have a clearer picture of it. When we, when we speak about cyber physical systems, just now I, I shared they, they include OT, IoT, and we also think about automation itself. While automation itself drives productivity and reduces the manpower overheads, ensures consistency in throughput, um, making the processes more reliable. On the downside from the negative uh, perspective, it is also a means to repeat human errors with rigor in a consistent manner. Think about the RPA or robotic process automation that many of you I believe have already deployed in your organizations. There is a need for strong RPA governance to prevent it from used in a malicious manner. So similarly, if this automation is not 
secured and malicious code is inserted, any errors could have could lead to loss of human lives. And as a result, cybersecurity and safety are increasingly synonymous. Do you know what all these um, company logos have in common? These are just some of the many um, organizations or companies that have been hacked due to a breach downstream in their supply chain. Okay. And what about this set of slides? Uh, what about this, this set of icons? Um, these are logos of suppliers who have resulted in the breaches of the upstream customers, the ones you saw in the previous slide. I mean, breaches can come in many forms, shapes and sizes, some even through their law firms, some through their managed services, and others through their maintenance contractors, whether it's HVAC for air cons uh, and so forth. This emphasizes the, com the complexity and importance of securing the supply chain, especially in 4.0, supply chain 4.0, where logistics are analyzed and predicted through predictive analytics. It is typical for hospitals to be generally classified as critical information infrastructure. Take for example, but are pharmaceuticals classified equivalently as critical inf information infrastructure? More often than not, they are not. But what happens when a pharmaceuticals manufacturing plants get breached by ransomware? As a result of that, patented life-saving drugs stop being produced and lives can be lost as a result because the hospitals uh, do not have the drugs to rely upon. That goes to show how important the supply chain itself is. Next, let me go into the topic of uh, understanding our enemies. Do we know? Now we know our terrain, right? what SMART is about. But do we know our enemies and what can they do and what we can't do against them? Essentially, there are different types of threat actors and different motivations. The key actors for critical information in structure now or when they get smarter are increasingly nation state hackers, such as uh, the not metal malware that was released, and crime syndicates who have the financial power and increasingly leveling up towards the capabilities of uh, nation state actors. It doesn't help that nation state actors, their tools have been leaked time and again. So they are just being reused by the crime syndicates. It is now a new cybersecurity normal. What is this about? What are our limitations? It is important to understand that the inevitable of a breach will happen. The earlier slides have shown you that big and small companies have been breached. And we hear about breaches all the time in the papers, online. As long as there is a cyber footprint, an organization can be breached. It is no longer we are no longer talking about uh, prevention. And a few years back, it used to be that cybersecurity professionals all talk about it is not a matter of if but when incidents would happen. In more recent years, this has been elevated to either you know you are breached or you don't. So the question in your mind now will be, in this era of having a notion of assumed breach, right? 
then how can we then future proof against the inevitable? We might as well give up. Right? <clears throat> For a solution, um, I like to look towards Sun Tzu. Right? Sun Tzu has a very famous quote. Know ourselves, know our enemies, a hundred battles, a hundred victories. If you look at the bottom quote, this is not from Sun Tzu. Ah. This is from the Sing Health COI. And it is a very important statement. Out of that 450 plus pages in the Committee of Inquiry report, this statement to me is the most important in the entire report. It's, it states that while cyber defenses will never be impregnable, and it may be difficult to, de to prevent an advanced persistent threat, or APT for short, from breaching the perimeter of the network. The success of the attacker in obtaining and exfiltrating the data is not inevitable. This will be clearer in my later slides when I talk about the cyber kill chain. Essentially, what this means is that you can address a breach before impact to your business or your company is realized by the attacker. Because there are a series of steps that the attacker will take. And I feel that it is important for you to take a moment for that to sink in, as this has a big influence on how the security architecture has to evolve. Digital equivalence. This slide, I'm presenting this slide is just so that uh, if you are interested to know more, uh, you can look into um, these terminologies, these terms. When we talk about our enemies in cyber term technical terms, we look at uh, from the left indicators of exposure, which essentially refers to our vulnerabilities and indicators of attacks as well as indicators of compromise. Okay. You can read more about that on your own. Um, so what are our limitations and how would it ag ag aggravate in smart cities? I'm sure everybody know what this is. This is a smart TV. Does it have a camera? How many of you connect it online? And how many of you actually patched it re religiously? How many of these unpatched smart TVs are there out there? And how many are residing in hotel rooms facing the bed? If this isn't bad enough, a casino was breached just because of a thermostat in a fish tank that is also connected to the internet and their internal casino network. So with IIoT, this will get worse. Cyber physical limitations, um, IOT needs to ensure that risk is to an, risk is at a, a minimum or optimal. Therefore, its underlying foundation is very much the same as OT. Inheriting a large bulk of its design flaws, unlike IT, the cybersecurity requirements of OT prioritizes differently. I, I alluded to this earlier on, as AIC. In OT, and unlike IT, safety comes foremost, right? And IIoT is an extension. A case in point, um, IOT tends to be weaker in computing power. Hence, um, even during the trials of uh, blockchain, they have to resort to weaker hashes. 
instead of using industrial acceptable SHA-256 hashes, for instance. And this impact their ability to comply to standards. When I was judging for one of the hackathons, none of the blockchain developers used anything higher than RC4. And this was partly the reason why separate IoT security standards have to be developed. And having its roots again in OT, IoT tends to be insecure by design with hard-coded passwords and they lack orchestration. For instance, if you need to configure an IoT device, you need to go to each and every one of its web interface to configure them. There is a lack of central deployment solutions. Any secure industrial protocols that have no authentication and encryption are often put in place um, because they are, again, originally built for closed systems, which I, I mentioned early on. And for the reason of safety and thoroughness in testing, the operating system and third-party security fixes are often slow in being certified by the, by the vendors. And if they are not certified, you can't install them. Otherwise, you will void their warranty. So lastly, they are often hard to retrofit uh, due to the large scale of them. Think about all the billions of sensors and tight legacy interactions. So any, any component change often requires extensive testing and customization. And we talk about the perils of patching. Let's say we, we earlier mentioned that the orchestration is difficult. Let's say even if you are able to orchestrate patches, how complex is your system? How fast can you test a patch? How complete is your testing? And can you risk inflicting uh, denial of service attack, self-inflicted denial of service? Which was exactly what happened to the Queensland hospitals during the WannaCry patch frenzy. Out of their panic, when they see NHS being breached, they panic and install the patch without adequate testing. I can't imagine what happened to their life support systems. And more recently, I'm sure you heard about Meltdown and Spectre. Uh, factory systems were hit by post Meltdown and Spectre patch glitches. And then you have Windows updates having problems needing the rollback. So putting in context of cyber physical system, systems, imagine your human machine interfaces or HMIs being patched and getting into issues as well. You immediately have a loss of view and control. And it's no laughing matter, it's a matter of life and death. There are so many imperfectly written software out there. Right? How are we in this case? We talk about defibrators, we talk about pacemakers. How are we going to remotely patch a life dependent device? Are we going to pull it out from the chest? Every time we need to patch, we operate the chest, pull it out, patch it, and put it back in. That's unrealistic, right? And there are tons of vulnerabilities out there. Talking about OT, um, many years back, in a role that I previously had, I was evaluating um, automated guided vehicle products. So this is an automated guided vehicle that was on trial, which I tested many years ago. And just sending unexpected input causes the entire AGV to lock up. The worst part is when you stop testing it, it doesn't recover by itself. You have to be physically present at the AGV to press that fat big red button at its side to allow it to reset itself. And when we demand answers from the vendor itself, it turns out that the vendor had left an undocumented, so it was not on record at all, undocumented developer backdoor, which was not adequately protected. 
and the developers only tested, only fixed it after I told them I have the intention to escalate to US cert as part of responsible disclosure for new vulnerabilities. Of course, you can argue that in a closed network, the risks are lower because only trusted personnel have access across the network to the system. But what happens when you need to expose in our bid for digital transformation, for analytics, for the sensors to send information to a data lake or data ocean to be analyzed so that we can perform predictive analytics. The attack surface has grown. Right? And with all these and analytics coming into play, and with analytics, you think about the use of cloud. There are three key concerns with the underlying accessibility. First is the risk of watering hole attacks. So that's where everybody uh, it goes to. That is why it's called a watering hole. There was, for instance, a good example of it is uh, the not Patia malware. It relied on the MeDocs accounting software that Ukraine companies all have to use. It's mandated that they have to use it. So they compromised the software and when the update was retrieved and sent down, cascaded down, the update was malicious and it infected every single company that uses it. That resulted in a breach of many big companies, including FedEx, Musk, and Merck, one of the big pharmaceuticals. In one particular company, it took just seven minutes to incapacitate 45,000 endpoints and um, 4,000 servers. Seven minutes. So if you have a managed security service provider, can they react in less than seven minutes to contain the damage? The war is already over if they escalate to you for more than seven minutes. Then there is the challenge of uh, misconfigured leaky cloud buckets. I'm not sure why it always happens to AWS and not Azure. Maybe it just happens that AWS is more popularly used. As uh, leaky cloud buckets is misconfigured, even the big fours are not invulnerable, where customer data is temporarily hosted and they just leave it forgotten. And over time, the security posture deteriorates. Um, there was a slew of news relating to such misconfigured Amazon Web Services. And not least, DDoS attacks, distributed denial of service attacks, targeting IoT. And our IoT devices become part of the botnet, like, like what happened in the Mirai botnet case. So now, what are our threats and how easy it is to become a hacker? Anyone knows? How easy it is to become a hacker? So PwC has a very nice pictorial representation of threat scenarios against cyber physical systems at every point along the supply chain. It can start anywhere from 3D printing to cloud processing to delivery. So you can read about it yourself. I don't, I'm not going to go deep into that. And, um, and he also talks about containers on ships can be hijacked as well. So it has happened in the past. Containers of diamonds have been identified on ships and stolen by pirates. So you may be wondering, how do the pirates know which container contains the diamonds? And for you may also be wondering, why would people send diamonds in containers? So this, so what happened is these pirates they hired hackers to hack into the, the electronic portals containing many fast information. And from there, they know exactly which container it is and on which ship and what is the route and so forth. And there is also another incident at the port of Antwerp, a physical break-in of a shipper's office allowed his credentials to be stolen. And how was it stolen? It was stolen through a physical deployment of a key stroke logger that looks like a power strip. You know those power strip, you plug in a lot of uh, power plugs. It looks exactly like that. And the credentials were used to retrieve the pin 
that is used physically at the port terminal to retrieve a container that supposedly was containing bananas but was actually containing drugs. And the, the, the legitimate customers or legitimate clients only realized it, that the container was lost when they tried to retrieve the container. And as part of the process of architecting, it is of utmost importance to identify and prioritize threats and risks so that you can tune your architecture towards um, hindering, detecting, containing, and recovering from these threats. And threats, cyber threats are becoming increasingly impactful and sophisticated. I showed you a list of um, icons of uh, uh, big companies earlier. So why are these big boys I shown in the earlier slides breached? Advanced persistent threats do not just incur greater impact. Their modus operandi are getting more sophisticated and stealthy. And in the case of Sing Health, the attacker laid low for around a year inside the network before they compromised. The, the crown jewels. And in the cyber security realm, hackers follow what is otherwise known as a cyber kill chain. Earlier on, I shared about the, that Sing Health statement, right? It relates to the cyber kill chain, and uh, it's CKC for short. Uh, it's coined by Longhi Martin after it got breached. And it is largely adapted from the military uh, kill chain. And to design an architecture well, it is absolutely essential to understand the tactics, techniques, and procedures, otherwise known as TTPs, of threat actors. So remember, I showed you the Sun Tzu out of war. We need to really we need to understand our enemies. The attack could begin as a phishing email or a watering hole. And the objective of an effective any effective architecture is to disrupt the attacker as he steps through the kill chain. Typically, kill chains, the simplest version has seven phases. And what we want is our architecture to be able to disrupt the hacker. I mean, the architecture supported by people and processes, of course, to be able to disrupt the attacker and hinder its movement, arrest the movement before it can navigate through the kill chain, before it can impact the business. How easy it is, is it to be a hacker? Can a nine-year-old kid become a hacker overnight? The answer is yes. Simply by Googling at two key websites. The first I'm showing on this slide now here is the MVD or National, otherwise known as the uh, National Vulnerability Database maintained by the US. I use the Example over here of a Schneider Electric Structure Ware Building Operations Automation Server. From the name of it, from the sound of it, you can tell that it's OT related, right? So from here, you can tell that the version that is vulnerable is version 1.7 or lower, right? And notice that the exploit, the exploit is from exploit DB, there's a link to it, and you can download the exploit. And there you go, you have the exploit. But the next question that comes to your mind is, if I know the exploit, but where are those vulnerable systems I can attack? Do I know their IP addresses? Well, fret not. You have another search engine. There is a search engine for every purpose, whether it's crawling the dark web, the dark net, or simply searching for vulnerable systems. And cybersecurity professionals all know about Shodan. It's spelled as S-H-O-D-A-N. You can visit the website www.shodan.io and simply register an account and use it to check your company footprint, whether it's exposed to the internet without actively performing intrusive uh, pop scans or vulnerability scans. You can search for power stations, you can search for whatever not. 
So recall the earlier example, I used the MVD to download the exploit that targets the structure where building operations automation server. And by keying in selectively various versions, I can pinpoint exactly what are the IP addresses I can attack and successfully breach. I have censored some of them over here. So isn't this very easy? You have the exploit, you have the IP address, just run the exploit against the IP. Of course, I'm not encouraging you to do this. This tool, it can be used for white hats as well. It's useful for checking your organization's internet facing footprint and the health of your security posture. And to make things worse, you may not even bother to research a vulnerability or download an exploit. Busybox is a very popular operating system used by many IoT equipment. And those of you who have um, played with Unix or Linux before would know that hex, the hex or the pound or the hex sign means the or the hash sign means uh, root access. And in this case, just by connecting to the IP address, you don't even need to log in at all. And then DDoS, distributed denial service is definitely on the rise. You have threats associated with compromised IoT devices. In the likes of the Mirai, bot, Mirai botnet, I mentioned swarms of IoT devices used to send traffic targeting a specific system to bring it down. In the die DNS attack, it targeted DNS servers. And as a result, a lot of um, fully qualified domain names cannot be resolved into the IP addresses. And we have also seen the wiper worm, not Petya. Not Petya, some people call, uh, call it ransomware, but uh, it is more known as a wiper worm because even if you pay the ransom, you can't get it, get your data back. And it's causing DOS of every single Windows systems in the domain or the enterprise network. And then more recently, we see unprecedented volumetric uh, ransom DOS or RDOS hitting GitHub as well as a US service provider. Uh, it is otherwise affectionately known as the DDoS for Bitcoin or DD4BC. Some of our local banks uh, encountered it a few years back. Okay. They are seeing a resurgence. Attacks have increased in 2019. And then I spoke about cyber physical convergence and the attack surface being greater because of uh, cyber and physical threats combined. I'm going to sh uh, share with you three examples. Firstly, GPS has been um, spoofed. So if you rely on, it can be spoofed, it can be jammed. So if you rely on GPS heavily in your architecture, you need to consider land-based navigation systems as backup. And it is no longer adequate to just simply look at the cyber architecture itself. And it's important to look at the physical setup as well. Do you lock down the USB port to protect against Arcular USBs, for instance, which can cause a short circuit of your equipment if connected? So in, in, in my workplace, we, we do um, purchase uh, USB port lockers, which you can physically lock it up to prevent such uh, attacks from things uh, from happening. And of course, the third one, uh, drones. In this example, in this, in this uh, source from PC Magazine, even hobby drones can be used to effectively jam industrial access points by flying close to them. This is a tough problem to solve and where the integration of physical and cyber monitoring becomes very important. In this case, how on earth is the security guard going to know that the drones, that the drone incursions should be reported to the cyber team? And how would the cyber team correlate and assess wireless access point breach to a drone incursion. And this is why, and the reason why, 
architecturally, um, many companies are, especially in critical infrastructure, they are looking at integrated monitoring. That as a one-stop operation center looking at physical operations as well as cyber. Okay, this is the third, top, third um, area of my topic for today, my session. is architecting for future proving. So I spent the first part of this session focusing on the problem statement. How, and now we move forth to architecting for future proving. In the next few slides, I'll run through key guiding principles, security controls, and how trans these examples of how this can be translated into an architecture. And an important note here is that it is important to bear in mind that reference architectures are, as the name implies, uh, references. And they have to be tweaked to tune and tune so that they can take into account the nuances of the various industries and operational requirements. Again, Sun Zi, this is the last Mao. <clears throat> doing the right things right. We always talk about governance. Doing the right things right. And how does it interface with architecture? Governance focuses very much on what needs to be done. And architecture focuses very much on the how. These two cannot do without the other for effectiveness. And so in the remaining slides, I'll cover what is expected in the area of governance and architecture design needs. In my opinion, in my view, um, governance and architecting for future proving, uh, there are six key steps. I'll just briefly cover and touch through some of them some of the governance area before elaborating more on the architecture aspects. The governance piece is important as it covered, as it serves as a critical inputs to the architecture. Okay, <clears throat> first and foremost, when we talk about cybersecurity, it's always about risk, right? We don't do security for the sake of security. It's always about risk. Ultimately, what is the objective of good governance and architecture? It is to enable, enable the business to function, correct or not? With that comes alignment with the, the organization's risk appetite. If your organization's risk appetite is low, then your architecture will, would have a lot more controls in place. However, it is also important not to overdo the controls. And that is the reason why I use the, word, the, the phrase risk optimization and not risk reduction or risk mitigation. Because it is a bottomless pit. How, how much can you reduce risk? How much can you mitigate risk? As shown earlier, a breach is inevitable. It will never be ending unless we are able to optimize risk to what the business wants. We don't want to overdo, we don't want to underdo. So ownership of risk is important. Many folks within the organization may be responsible for deploying controls, but there should only be one risk owner being accountable. And this risk owner holds the purse strings and decides the risk level and security investment to shoot for. Okay, don't, don't, don't be worried about this uh, like very wordy slide. To understand, to really understand the TTPs of the tools, the uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures of attackers, and to design, to be able to design your architecture to address the threats at different levels of the architecture. Beyond the CKC, the Lockheed Martin CKC cyber queue chain I mentioned with you earlier, you can adopt the unified queue chain or UKC, as well as a MITRE attack framework, which is very popular nowadays. So for instance, in my, in my day job, when I assess a solution, whether it is a endpoint EDR, endpoint detection response solution, or it's a, it's a, it's a 
uh, threat hunting network traffic analytics tool. I asked the solution vendors to provide me with a, a mapping of their efficacy against preventing or detecting the different techniques under the MITRE attack framework. Because each of the tactic, each of the seven, uh, will have different techniques and ensure that the solution is complementary to the rest of the components of my architecture. That my security catalog is uh, all encompassing. So as to allow me uh, a large coverage of the attacker's uh, modus operandi. And it is also important to adopt key principles. Key security principles have major influences on to your architecture. Eventually, operations, management, monitoring, all these are very important. And the network architecture needs to be designed to ensure layered defenses, ease of hardening, continuous vulnerability assessment, ease of monitoring and containment. I'll give you an example. For instance, you may want to deploy AO2.1x and uh, network emission control and establish a quarantine network so as to contain suspected inspected systems uh, very promptly. This applies to IT um, more easily than in OT. In the case of OT and its nuances, which I've shared earlier, this may not be an ideal choice. And nowadays, security and privacy, we need to look at it together. There is, it's not only security by design where we shift left, but if it's looking at the tool chain in DevSecOps, ops, uh, shifting left, looking at designing security right. Um, th is, there is an importance of integrating privacy by design, especially with privacy regulations like PDPA, GDPR, CCPA. And the architecture design needs to ensure data is stored, used, and transferred in a secure manner. And it's also important to adopt a cybersecurity framework, whether it's NIST, CSF, or it's ISO 27000 series or COBE, which amalgamates all of these different standards all together in one big standard. Using the NIST cybersecurity framework or CSF as an example, the architecture of smart cities um, have to focus a lot more on detection, response, and recovery. Why? Again, back to the original notion that statement in the Sting Health COI, because breaches are inevitable. It is now all about being able to detect, respond, contain and recover fast. The question is, can we contain a sensor and limit its impact before it is, uh, once it's breached? And how fast can we do that? And we spoke earlier about clouds uh, in, in, in 4.0, industrialization 4.0, a lot more cloud adoption, a lot more analytics, setup of data lakes and data oceans and so on. So there are many cybersecurity guidelines you can refer to. Considering the risk of supply chain 4.0, the architecture interfaces with third party providers, such as cloud service providers. Think about the watering hole attacks. The and um, so many OT and IoT products which were originally not designed with security in mind because they were meant for a closed network now have to evolve as they grow in maturity. And until then, how can we assess those gaps and address them? Such guidelines, which I've listed here, serve as, uh, serve as good references, even though uh, quite a number of them focus a large part on process rather than technology. And what are the key uh, cloud security considerations? when we think about architecting. Here is an uh, example of security by design. 
Um, I mean, during the tender stage, you want to ensure adequate controls are in place, that the proposed architecture have these controls. And um, protecting against club threats, first and foremost, that identifying the asset criticality and sensitivity is, is um, paramount. We need to do that so that you can manage the risk to the right level. The roles and responsibilities must be clear. Um, here are some of the pre-deployment key controls. And regardless, regardless of whether it's IAS, SAS, SAS, or PAS, my, my rule of thumb is that the security of a cloud-based deployment should not be worse off than an on-premise deployment. If it is, then this additional risk must be accepted by the risk owner. Right? We don't just use the cloud for the sake of showing people that we are at the forefront. So does your architecture provide an ease of... So I, I, I use an example below on forensics process during breach. So one thing to think about your architecture is does it provide an ease of collecting forensics data, for instance? With cloud adoption and the thought of uh, elastic provisioning, right? So VMs are uh, provisioned and deprovisioned as and when you need resources. From a security viewpoint, can you get back the image for forensics? If the VM has already been deprovisioned, it's already released back to the common pool and reused. So how are you going to perform forensics if after you release it back to the common pool, you realize that there was a breach? So is there a clause in your contract allowing a backup of old images to be archived? For a certain period before removal, right? And over and beyond um, pre-deployment checks and at the secure uh, at the secure by design phase, uh, ongoing maintenance during secure by deployment phase is absolutely critical to prevent to protect against or mitigate against uh, misconfigured cloud like those are uh, leaky Amazon Web AWS buckets. This includes uh, regular checkpoint meetings. Uh, and having that oversight, that is where the governance piece is very important. And as the threat and risk posture evolves, it is also important to always constantly revisit the architecture to ascertain if the security posture still manages to address the threat posture to achieve an optimal risk level, like what I've shown earlier. Because the threat landscape is evolving very fast. And if not, a cybersecurity program needs to be put in place to drive initiatives to elevate the posture maturity accordingly. So for cyber physical systems, so we talked about cyber physical systems earlier, some key cybersecurity controls that needs to be addressed are in these eight areas. I won't go into each of them, but there are three, uh, there are a number that translates directly into architecture design such as network security, vulnerability management, and incident management. I use vulnerability management and I don't uh, talk about patch management. Okay. Um, why, why, why I don't call it patch management is because patching is just a means to an end. And I alluded to earlier that patching is very difficult for OT and IoT as well. So there are different ways to skin the cat. There are different ways besides patching to fix a vulnerability. And this includes as straightforward as disabling an unused service to as sophisticated as virtual patching, which essentially uh, talks about using a web application firewall, using a, a, a intrusion prevention system, and so on and so forth. So it is important to, to establish a risk-based vulnerability remediation timeline that depends on the trap posture, attack surface exposure, as well as exploit availability. As alluded to earlier, many IoT equipment are insecure by design, right? And patches are slow. So there must be ways to mitigate their risk. I'll share more later on. And for incident management, I shared how an assumed bridge approach has to be considered in the architecture design. 
do you consider an integrated cyber physical SOC or security operations center in your monitoring regime? Do you consider the ease of containment in the management plane to mitigate damages? And have you in considered or included the architecting of offline backups with versioning to ensure that backups are not inevitably encrypted by the ransomware as well. So one of the companies that was hit by NotPetya, their backups were online and their online backups were encrypted as well. And they had to rebuild everything from scratch. And is your backup network properly segregated? You can have different zoning security zones in your production for your production traffic. But if all these servers or systems have a flat, are using a flat backup network, then it, it is a risk. And if the access control, the firewall access control or ACLs are not put in place adequately, through the backup VLAN or backup network, a compromised server can infect another server, which is supposed to be in an entirely different security zone. And with that, I come to network security. Network security should be based on layered defenses, and they can come in many varieties, whether it's defense in depth, defense uh, by diversity, you use different technologies. Um, and how granular we want that to be? Minimally diversity between different security zones or tiers, such as the use of two different mix of uh, firewalls at different tiers. You may have the first, tier as Cisco, the next tier as checkpoint, as first tier as Polo Apto, next uh, tier as checkpoint, for instance, just giving an example. Um, and NIST SP800, Special Publication uh, 800-82, uh, released to, is a very useful architecture guidance you can use for operational technology. And um, you should read it if you have not done so. Layer defenses are important. As, as repeated and reported upon earlier, you can hinder the attacker, disrupt the attacker so much so that the action on objectives, that means the impact to the business cannot be achieved. And you want to do that, you want to fend, detect and fend off the attacker while it is on your network before they can achieve these objectives. And there are many modes of layered defenses, whether you layer at different OSI protocol layer or by technology, or by micro segmentation to self contain and support granular rules or even active defense. So, what is active defense? This is an approach that is catching up very fast nowadays simply because it is inevitable there's a breach. So, and, and, and um, for OT environments, they tend you are tr you try your best not to temper with the components too much because they are so critical, as I alluded to earlier. So active defense is especially important in such environments because equipment are operational critical and you focus on detecting and monitoring instead. So you deploy NTA or Network Traffic Analytics or what are otherwise known as MBA, Network Behavior Analytics, or UEBA, User Entity Behavior Analytics, uh, which are useful for such environments because these environments tend to be pretty homogeneous and you should be able to enumerate and baseline the normal behavior so that you can easily compare when there is a variation and detect sophisticated attacks as a result. And um, this is a further illustration of how you can control the entry vectors over the network and between hosts through the use of uh, managed or orchestrated network or, and host-based firewalls. As, as, as shared earlier, the, the key entry vectors are physical breach. If there is a physical breach, everything goes right. You can just use a hammer to hammer the, the equipment. That's a denial of service effect. Uh, besides that would be USBs, I alluded to the killer USBs and over the cyber network. Since vulnerabilities are often slow, in being patched. So this is a challenge, right? It is important to use security gateways or jump holes to shield this vulnerability off. 
So you can't touch the OT equipment. So what, what do you do? You, you front it with a secure equipment, like a jump hose. And uh, having firewall rules or micro segmentation, we talk about zero trust. So micro segmentation comes into play over here. Add equipments uh, would prevent a worm to, to spread easily during an outbreak. Right. Think about the monocry and the not petia, they are using SMB, right? Port 445. If you don't open up port 445 across all your Windows machines, which have no, no, no business with one another to communicate, you're not talking file shares, then the, the spread will be have been contained. And this is another elaboration of layered defense principle I spoke about earlier. And this is from Microsoft. Notice, I am showing this slide because I want to show you the extensive use of gateways in IoT deployment. Okay, so this is from SP800-82, uh, the NIST uh, guideline. It has a very detailed reference architecture of where the firewall, the IDS sensors, and other security solutions should be at. And if you look correspondingly at the Purdue model, ISA 99 model, uh, this this SPR-82 serves as a good architecture reference, architecture reference mapping. And uh, but due to the peculiar nuances at different industries, it is not always doable. Why do I say that? So for instance, the vendor may manage the internal network of a cyber physical system. This is managed by the vendor. They don't want the customer to touch it. So does it allow you to manage it? If you, if you touch it, the warranty is void. So in that case, um, other controls need to be put in place, right? As you move further away from the edge. Another example I would like to point out is in the use of diodes. Diodes is a dirty word. In my dictionary, diodes, uh, dirty word because they are often touted, easy to say, and overly touted as a solution to provide uh, to protect OT and IoT. It is important for us to understand that there are certain industries with peculiarities that require bidirectional traffic initiation. I've spoken to some vendors, and their response would be. Well, then you have two diodes, one for incoming traffic, one for outgoing traffic. But in my opinion, that defeats the purpose. Why? Because as with the cyber queue chain you sh uh, I've shared earlier, a malware can enter in one direction and the C2 or the command and control channel can exit the other and defeats the purpose. And even if you are to consider putting a data diode in front of every single PLC, how are you going to manage or castrate them? For instance, if you have eight or nine PLCs in every cyber physical system, and you have hundreds of these systems, diodes still have its place, don't get me wrong, but in my opinion, data diodes are good if you are concerned with firewalls themselves being breached, or you have a high risk of getting human errors, like misconfigured ACLs. And I shared earlier about the active cyber defense. Uh, active cyber defense covers the process of threat hunting as well. So you need to deploy EDRs, endpoint detection and response, or network traffic analytics to actively look for threats. And architecting the monitoring plane. So you have the management plane, your operational plane, you have the management plane, you, you need the monitoring plane to, to consider this aspect how the integration with network, uh, the NDA and NTA tools, etc., to support it, to sift out the sophisticated threats. So why threat hunting? Threat hunting is needed because it can sift out sophisticated threats which are otherwise undetectable through those traditional security detection through tools, like IDS and SIEMs, and what you have not. And from uh, an architecture viewpoint, it is important that the solution architecture itself be optimized. I need to highlight this based on business needs, operational risk. I, so it all starts with risk, right? You need to align 
We need to align with enterprise risk. Don't overdo, don't underdo it. That is what we call enable the business. Security is always about enabling the business and to align with security and regulatory requirements and the, with the rational risk uh, approved by the risk owner. So over here, for those of you who have taken uh, TOGAF, this is not unfamiliar to you. It's a good reference in this aspect. And this is another perspective for defense in depth. Okay, this takes somewhat uh, reference to the OSI layers. You see the different tiering, network server endpoint in a way. Uh, there are processes and technologies that have to be catered for in this architecture, in the architecture to allow compliance or rather conformance to the NIST cybersecurity pillars of identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And some of these technologies may straddle multiple layers or tiers. I'll give the busy slide. This is not developed by me. This is the Microsoft reference architecture. And notice that it includes the cloud and uh, IoT and OT aspects. I'm not going to delve into this architecture in detail, but I just want to use the Active Directory or Domain Controller as an example. Because I feel that too often people don't look carefully at their domain controllers. I would recommend that domain controllers for OT or IoT be separated from the domain controller for corporate in a split approach. One of the reasons is that many CII that have occurred in the news to be breached yeah, is because their AD or domain controller is, is shared. And it's not when they are supposed to be air gap, when the critical assets are supposed to be air gap, their AD is shared. So it is in effect not effectively segregated. As in the case with the non petal malware, the malware uses Mimikatz and it was able to steal I mean credentials and it was able to compromise the AD. And once the AD is compromised or the domain controller is compromised, it will get the keys to the kingdoms. Any machine that is joined to the domain is gone. Okay. So in this case, the OT human machine interfaces or HMIs on our windows, right? If they share the same domain, you think about it this way, your corporate PCs, they have internet access. The machines that connect to your critical, uh, critical information infrastructure, they should not have internet access. But because of the shared AD, the threats may come in through the internet, hit your corporate PCs, hit the AD, and then hit the HMIs that are using the same AD. And not least, you, uh, it's important to look at the configuration of the AD forest. Uh, careful, careful consideration has to be uh, has to look at the risk of a of a breach of a hash based attacks. Those are past the hash attacks or the hash based attacks due to the two way trust of forest resulting in a in a cross forest attacks of uh, AD credentials. And there are many other considerations, but in the interest of time, I will not dwell into them. And this is another reference architecture from the OT vendor perspective. In this case, uh, Siemens work with Aruba, right? Uh, one obvious thing you can see is there's only a single entry point across the network. That is through the firewall that is cementing IT and OT, right? There are a myriad of switches and PLCs in the OT side. Um, it is important to place the right systems in the DMZ, such as historians, beverage access management systems, ADs, monitoring servers, log servers, and so forth. Question, do you think antivirus or application whitelisting is more important, more suitable for HMIs? So in the past, it is not just Microsoft releasing bad patches, but also antivirus vendors releasing 40 signatures. They end up quarantining legitimate Windows executables uh, such as svchost.exe. So can you imagine you let it auto update the antivirus signature and the antivirus actually causes your HMIs to crash and constantly keep rebooting and rebooting because every time it boots up, the svchost get, gets quarantined. So 
all these are the peculiarities with OT that you cannot apply to. Uh, therefore, you cannot apply IT measures on OT. Because OT, remember, SAIC, safety and availability is of utmost importance. And when it comes to deploying the right technologies, there are tons of technologies out there. Uh, this is just, uh, this is from uh, Momentum Cyber. Tons of them, and it's ever growing. So from an architectural standpoint, there is a need to balance diversity to avoid uh, the gaps, to put, avoid putting all eggs in one basket. On the other hand, you also want to consider standardization to avoid the complexity and the force multiplier effect with the, as with additional technologies, you have additional hardening guides, you have more vulnerabilities to address and you have interoperability issues. Minimally, I think the diversity should be at the different zones rather than within each zone. It may be onerous to be within each zone, but it should at least be in the different tiering of security zones. Log logically, um, so it is always help helpful to scatter your eggs so that the when there is a zero day vulnerability that there's no patch, no solution, you have your other defenses in place to mitigate against it. And your operations can continue to function. Okay, um, and moving ahead, looking further ahead, uh, the technology, here are some of the technologies you should watch out beyond traditional security in the following areas. For instance, and uh, I mean, an all-encompassing GRC dashboard is not new, but the, the, the risk management part is uh, maturing with the FAIR model and so forth. Uh, behavioral analytics, I've shared that integrated cybersecurity sort, I've mentioned that. Blockchain security, privacy, preserving analytics in the form of homomorphic encryption. Because as we move into smart cities, smart systems, analytics, and when you use the, if the algorithm is on the cloud, whether it's IBM cloud solution for an analytic, IBM analytics, the algorithm is the cloud. You have to share your data with them before they can analyze, right? So how do you protect your data? Um, it is a maturing technology. There are some um, greenfield vendors who are, who are looking into this. So with homomorphic encryption, you can expose your data to the cloud service provider in encrypted form, yet you can still analyze it. For his, for his uh, analytics. And 5G is definitely another area that needs to be taken into architecture consideration. For instance, um, 5G networks support network slicing. Uh, it's one of the most important and en enabling technologies. Um, what it means is um, the, by having slicing security, it allows the network to provide differentiated and tailored security features and it uses uh, the shared network infrastructure to meet the various requirements. In a way, it's somewhat like micro-segmentation or you call it a VPC circuit of sorts. And this has to be uh, utilized amongst other considerations. Um, okay, what is this? In the first industrialization, this is the first car. Okay, so, it's apparent that there's no security by design or even privacy by design in that aspect. There's no security belts, it's all in the open. You have a branch falling on your head and that's it. Um, but it's slow, right? And we have to involve industrialization 3.0, you have a lot of safety measures put in place. So cars have come a long way before maturing. And the risk appetite has grown. Even though there are incidents and the car travels fast, we still drive, right? We don't say because cars can get into incidents, we, everybody walks to work. So the posture is elevated uh, against impact in accordance. So wh what is my point over here? My point is that IoT and IoT, even though they are insecure by design right now, and we have to use a lot of architecture um, setups to, to, to protect it, to shield it off, um, OT, then they're not mature. Eventually, they'll gain in maturity with more regulations imposed. 
like the trust marks that uh, the UK regulators are, are already looking into right now for IoT consumables. And architecture has to evolve accordingly with it. And not forgetting the eco ecosystem. Um, this is this is unlike the architecture we has evolved over time. So the car itself, it is is it's not just the car that has to be secure. Right? It is all the other things that goes with it. The roads, how the lanes are marked, the traffic light systems and so forth. So with that, architecture also requires layered defenses and agility to better adapt to new threats and uh, vulnerabilities as they arise. And very important is the emphasis on detection and containment, right? CCTV's equivalent. So all is not doom and gloom. I want to leave off, uh, leave off this session with uh, a positive note. Therefore, my, my final words are that it's not all doom and gloom. Transiting to the new cybersecurity normal, architecture has to consider better converged monitoring, automated containment, seven minutes. Recall it takes only seven minutes to encrypt 45,000 endpoints and 4,000 servers in the case of non packet outbreak. Architecture alone is also has to be supported by good governance, processes, and people. Okay, with that, I have ended my session. As mentioned in the beginning, I hope that you have find my presentation relevant and useful. Again, if nothing else, I hope that you can walk away with understanding the top process that goes behind the solutioning of such an architecture. Uh, based largely on my personal experience, I, I hope to hear from you as well in this uh, architecture community of practice. We are, after all, only as strong as our ecosystem. The only way to, I feel, to keep up with all these rising threats uh, is to find weaknesses in our own ideas. And therefore, I feel that it's important to connect with you. And I'd love to hear from you whether you agree or especially if you disagree and why. And you may know something that I don't, right? Nobody knows everything. I look forward to cross sharing of ideas, which is essentially what this community practice is about. And not least, um, stay safe and secure. And let me know if you have uh, any questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, uh, Stephen, for the very uh, informative and detailed session. We still have some time before the Zoom session ends. If any of you um, would like to uh, post your question for Stephen, you may do so now. Just unmute yourself and then you can ask your question. So any questions from the, the participants for Stephen? I mean, if, if there are no questions, uh, you can always catch me online, uh, whether it's through LinkedIn or through email. I'm more than glad to uh, discuss and uh, discuss with you. Okay. Uh, seems like there's no question, right? I think your session must be very. Uh, uh, <laughs> very okay. There's one question: whether you get the slides. Definitely, I'll be sharing the slides out. Oh, the chat, yeah. Now then I see the chat, yeah. So, uh, yeah, you'll get the slides. And also for, if you fill in the feedback, right, for this session, right, then uh, we also um, send you the slides and also the link for this uh, the recorded session. Because actually, we have actually recorded this session. So if you do the feedback after this uh, session, we'll send you the slides and also the recorded link, right, for this session. So last call for question, uh, for any questions before we uh, end this session. Many thanks uh, for 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 attending this session. Right? Yeah, I see we have like um at the peak is like fifty attendees we have. Yeah. So um, if there's no questions, then um, our next ACOP forum, our twenty second ACOP forum, will be on uh fifth May. Right? The speaker uh will be Sajiv Kumar. He's a regional um cybersecurity architect. Come enterprise architect with BNW Group Asia. So his topic on 5th May, right?